Hey, Jim Hoffman here for EMSSEO.com and the Monday Minutes. <clears throat> um, today, we're going to continue on with the neurological emergencies, and we are going to focus today a little bit on stroke and TIAs. And while you might know a lot of this content already, you just want to explain, before I would like to mention why this stuff is important, right? Um, basically, you know, this stuff is important when we take our exams because these are the key elements that you'll often see on a lot of EMS exams. So it's important to know these key elements of these broader topics that we uh, discuss in EMS. But it's also important because when you're doing your patient assessment, when you're speaking with other healthcare professionals, when you're doing your documentation, all this content, these key points, um, kind of broader markers that you're looking for when you're assessing your patient all come into play. So it's not just about doing your EMS exam, right? It's about <clears throat> your patient assessment, it's about your documentation, it's about all of that. So that's why all this stuff is important. So while you may think you know everything there is to know about stroke and you might actually know the key points already, reviewing this once in a while is a good way to just sort of refresh your memory. And of course, if you don't remember this type of stuff and you need to look at the broader aspect of this, I encourage you to open up your textbook and go ahead and look further into it. Um, okay, so stroke, right? That's a cerebrovascular accident, the CVA, or a TIA, the transient ischemic attacks. And the strokes, the CVA, they result from the interruption of the circulation to the brain, which causes that, that ischemia to the brain tissue. So your neurological system symptoms you're going to see are going to often persist much, much longer uh, and usually 24 hours or more. Now, recovery for this takes place in weeks to months, um, depending upon the severity, right? <clears throat> now you've got your two types of CVAs. One is your occlusive, and that's usually three out of four strokes are going to be your occlusive stroke. And those are caused by the blockage in a blood vessel, right? Preventing that blood to get to where it's got to go. And the second one is your hemorrhagic, okay? And this is caused by bleeding inside the brain. And those symptoms you're going to see for those hemorrhagic strokes are going to be very abrupt and very severe, okay? Um, treatment at the hospital is mostly are going to be those clot busters, right? And that's usually only going to be for your occlusive strokes. And usually have the time, time frame, there's a window, which is why we always try to find out when our patients started having signs and symptoms um, of the stroke, okay? Depending upon where you are, it can be between three and six hours, okay? Back in, you know, a few years ago, it was three hours. Now we're up to about five or six hours, okay? A lot of patients wake up in the morning with the symptoms, and by that time it's too late because you have no idea when it started. They went to bed at 10 p.m., and they woke up at 7 a.m. Did the symptoms start at 10.15 after they fell asleep, or did they start when they woke up at 7 o'clock? There's no way to know. So that's why it's very important to try to find out when the last time the patient was seen normal and asymptomatic, okay? Now, your assessment for these patients... You know, most commonly it's going to be the paralysis, usually hemiplegia, which is that damage on one side of the brain, which is going to affect the opposite side of the body. Okay, so if it's on your left side of the brain, it's going to affect your right side. You're going to have the weakness and the you know, neuro deficit on the right side of the body. Um, a lot of the time, the patient will have an elevated blood pressure. You might see seizures, complaints of dizziness, loss of consciousness. Um, the headache is also a popular one, and your altered levels, uh, level of consciousness. Monitor the patient's airway. Uh, look for cardiac dysrhythmias as well. Of course, vomiting is also a very um, uh, ominous tough sort of sign as well, especially with those hemorrhagic slopes. Um, <clears throat> and of course, your pupillary abnormalities. Um, just want to mention, we talk about the altered level of consciousness, right? Um, is to sort of um, think about. Many patients, when they're having a stroke, a lot of times you they might be altered, but they still understand. They can still hear you, and they're understanding what it is that you're saying to them. So keep that in mind when you're assessing, when you're speaking around them. Okay, that they might actually be understanding what you're saying, but they can't verbalize. They can't respond to you appropriately. Now, most systems nowadays they use that Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale. And pretty much that's the assessment that, that you'll do to, to you know, kind of positive and neg negatively identify the stroke. So look for that facial droop, have them show their teeth or smile, their arm drift, have them close their eyes or hold their arms out. Normally they'll close their eyes, they'll put their arms out like this, and they'll have their palms up, okay, and see if you have a drift, if the arms are drifting one way or the other. And then the speech, um, often 
that won't afraid to tell people to do with it. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Okay, <clears throat> very common phrase to tell people, but most of the time, you'll be able to by speaking with the patient. Obviously, tell most of the time if they have a slurred speech, if they're having speech difficulties, forming the words, understanding the words. Um, a lot of times, they'll appeal that they want to speak and they they know in their brain what they want to say, but it won't come out. Okay, um, all assessment and all assessment markers you want to take note of. Um, you manage for these patients pretty much as any patient is maintaining the airway, maybe high flow oxygen, and considering intubation if you have to. Okay. Uh, nothing by mouth, by mouth, of course, like I mentioned, you could have that vomiting going on. You want to reassure the patients. Again, they might know what's going on. So reassure them to let them know that you're aware of what's happening, you're in control of what's happening, and sort of reassure them that you're taking care of them, taking them to the right facility. Start an IV, if it's in your, in your guidelines, most guidelines do want you to start an IV. Cardiac monitor for any cardiac rhythms that might be abnormal for the patient. Uh, new onsets of AFib are, also, are sort of a common thing they might see. And measure the blood glucose so that it, you can rule out if they are hypoglycemic or hyperglycemic. That might be masquerading as that stroke. Okay, so just some stuff to think about, guys. A lot of the management that I just talked about is what? It's common for a lot of patients, right? But when we're talking about CVAs and TIAs, this is a little bit more specific and things that you have to sort of think about in the back of your mind. And of course, you want to follow your local guidelines as well. Um, <clears throat> TIAs, we're touching this a little bit, guys. These are those mini strokes. You'll have very, very similar um, uh, signs and symptoms, uh, stroke-like neurological deficits that I, that I mentioned. And most of the time, those are resolved within minutes to hours. And uh, But the patient should really be encouraged to go to the hospital and be evaluated because many, many times... The TIA is sort of that precursor, that risk, uh, much, much higher risk for a stroke. So keep that stuff in mind, guys. You get that TIA, if you get there and the signs and symptoms have evolved, have evolved, go ahead and encourage them to go to the hospital because, like I said, that is a precursor for the bigger event that might be coming down the line, okay? This is why we always encourage our syncope patients as well, right? Because that could also be a precursor to a stroke also. So just keep that in mind, guys. Don't just blow it off if they had stroke symptoms and you get there and they're gone. Um, you know, even if it was just slurred speech, that could be the, the, the one thing that they go to the hospital then that can save them from having a bigger deficit in a long-term uh, recovery, okay? All right, guys, that's it for me today. Um, I hope you uh, can get something out of these minutes. Again, very common stuff. A lot, of, a lot of this I'm sure you might already know, but it's good to review it because, like I said, it's good to know these key elements for your exam, knowing occlusive versus hemorrhagic and which one is more common. That could be on an exam. Okay, keep this stuff in mind, guys, and keep it in mind too when you're assessing your patients, when you're doing your documentation, and speaking with other healthcare professionals. Um, I hope you can use them. Like I said, if you have any minutes of your own, send them over to me. It's admin at emsseo.com. Please, if you do find these helpful, guys, please share this video with one other person on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it may be. One other person to help spread the word and get this content out to, out to other EMS providers that might find this useful if they're coming up on an exam. So while you might be very familiar with this content, maybe a peer of yours or a peer of somebody you know might actually benefit from it if they're not as familiar with it as you are. So just share one other person for me. Be sure to like it as well below in the show notes. All right, guys, that's it for me. Um, as always, I am Jim Hoffman for EMS SEO. Uh, next week, we're going to continue on with our neurological emergencies, and we're going to talk about seizures and epilepsy. So until next week, as always, I'm Jim Hoffman, EMS Office Hours, EMS SEO, and the Monday Minutes. Stay safe. <laughs>